Shalom and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. <clears throat> I'm Rabbi Elliot Malamet in Highland Park, New Jersey, really in Highland Park, New Jersey now. Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Shemet. Joining me, my good friends, Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanovsky, Anche Chesed in New York City, Rabbi Barry Chesler, Salman Shekhar Day School of Long Island. Well, it's great to be back in, in, in North America, in the United States. Uh, came back last uh, right before Shabbat last week. Uh, and um, just a beautiful, beautiful time, as uh, our viewers and listeners know. We want to begin by saying a mazel tov to Cantor Carol Chesler, who was installed this past uh, Sunday, Sunday Sunday in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Lancaster. Barry, you want to tell us about it a little bit? Well, the first thing I, I guess is to remind you that Lancaster does not remind, does not uh, Rhyme with disaster. It's <laughs> Lancaster, not Lancaster, as the natives um, make Wait, it say it again? L Lancaster? Lancaster. Okay. And um, it was really a, a wonderful afternoon. Uh, it's really a great synagogue. Some special friends of my wife, Sherry Gudis, educational director at Macomb on Long Island. Rabbi David Cavill has been a friend of ours since he was a sophomore or junior in high school, now a rabbi. And um, it was a great day for the Jews, as they say. You know what? One of these days, the three of us, we're going to go, we're going to do a tour, live tour, right? We're going to go to Lancaster, we're going to go to Anche Chesed, and we're going to go to Highland Park, New Jersey. Live Man. tour. Parsha Sounds talk like live a great tour. Idea. And we're going to talk about the Parsha. This week's Parsha, Shlach Lecha. Okay, so so we got to, we got to, tee this up by saying this is first of all an amazing parsha but second of all um this is the turning point this is the turn this is where everything kind of goes awry this is the the crisis of many crises but the the major crisis that that results in the the decree that the israelites are going to spend the rest of their lives in the desert 38 more years or a total of 40 years in the desert and it, it all has to do with this mission, the mission that uh, God says to Moses, Shlach lecha anashim, send men to scout the land, vayaturu et Eretz Canaan, asher anon b'nei Yisrael, the land that I'm giving to b'nei Yisrael. And it's it's very confusing. What's confusing is, why, why do we need this mission? What is this mission about? Is this a, a, a reconnaissance mission? Is this a military mission, or is it something else? And and can you just? I mean, it's it's a simple question, but it's it's actually goes to the heart of the the whole the whole story. What is this about? Um, and um, I'm wondering if if you could we could start there and go into the details from from that starting point. Barry, you want to take it off? So I I think that we don't have a lot of information and. One piece of information that's critical is to compare the account in Joshua chapter 2, which is the Haftarach, conveniently enough, where Joshua sends two spies to scout out Jericho, Jericho in preparation for the conquest. So the Israelites have been, they haven't been wandering yet. They, they're on a directional journey. Um, they're into their second year, and they're about to, Enter the promised land. And um, I, I think as God says at one point, they don't trust him. In other words, God says, this is the plan. And the Israelites say, not so fast. And it's a very difficult moment because how do you convince people who do not feel that they're up for the task that they're up for the task? Mm -hmm. And as we find out in the Parsha, you can't really do that. Interesting. I know, Jeremy, do you have a take on this as a kind of coterit, a kind of headline for this, a, an overview? You know, you're 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 up before your shul, you're saying, you know, here's the overview of the story. This is about uh it's about ten minutes. It's about <laughs> ten minutes. I, I uh the, the way we read it's about 15 minutes, but I, I I don't know. I mean, I think that the because the specificity of Moses's task to the spies but you know go out check out the land is it a good land is it a bad land are there trees are there not trees you know are there lots of people small number of people 
Are the cities fortified or, or undefended? It's possible that Moses kind of intuits the answers to all those questions, and the spies are sent on a, a mission to report back to the people. Not that Moses needs the info, but that the people will need the info. And so the Moses wants to sort of place before the populace the, the route that they're going to face. But I'm inclined a little bit more to say that, uh, that the um, uh, richness of the detail of the instruction means that the people have been oriented towards um, this place. They've never been there. None of them have been there. Uh, and and so, like, they, they need to know uh, on human scale, not, I have promised this land to your ancestors. They need to know at human scale, like, where are we going? And uh, what, what kind of uh, vista can we expect to meet there? So let me let me approach this in in two ways. Uh, one that that almost seems obvious, which is that you know the word anashim is not miraglim, the, and and that this are these are men. They're they're leaders of their tribes. Um, they're influencers uh, of their tribes, and they are not specifically. And I'm picking up from uh, you know the the Milgram commentary here that they're not specifically. Uh, military people, uh, they're they're public relations people, and and maybe the the frame that I want to place around this is that Moses is engaged in um, a, a public opinion generation. He's got to get the people on board for what will be an arduous task. Look, they've they've gotten out of Egypt. They've had they've had some some real achievements up until now, and some real catastrophes. Um, and you know the 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 people have been set in one place. They they get up, they move, and now you know the, if if everything were to go along the plan, they were they were supposed to arrive you know momentarily into the land. But but they have to be ready. They have to be emotionally ready, spiritually ready, physically ready. You know there may be challenges there, and he needs the agency of these people to to help him. Convey, and I think the 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 mission or the the challenge he gives is basically like here, you know, take the cue from what I'm telling you because the land is a really good land, and I, I you know when I teach this, I, I count the words and I focus on the center words, and it's you know, tova tova, you know the the umaha uh, aris uh, verse nineteen is the land asher hu yoshev ba ha tova. He imra'a. And that word, hatova, is right at the center of what is a poetic kind of um, you know, instruction, right? It reminds me of like no Misha, Allah Aritz Hatova, the good land. That's, that's a, it's a frame or phrase that's in there. That's number one. So it's public relations. Number two is I almost want to say that there's this echo of the earlier story in Genesis where where you have an inversion. The the brothers come down because they're seeking to come down. They leave the land. They go to Egypt for food. And there are only 11 of them. And, and as the story uh, evolves, and Joseph charges them with being spies. You're being spies. And so, and so in some way, we have the inversion here of a, of a cohort and and of course Joseph is being ridiculous and difficult, and here they want to they they start out with innocence and they start out with a kind of, you know let's 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 see what this is about. But they come back totally demoralized. Um, and I, you know is it could could we make the bow between between the brothers and these leaders? Is that is that too far fetched? I mean that would be my. My so, challenge. <laughs> what I want to suggest is that it's an aesthetic issue. Yeah. When Moses said, is the land good? It's only good if you see it as being good. It It's entirely up to the viewer to determine the quality of goodness. And the problem for B'nai Israel is that there are deficient people. They're, they've been battered and bruised to use a, a language that is perhaps a little trite, but 
they're they're not well equipped for the task and they're looking for ways around it and moses is saying to them if you could see this as being a good land it can be ours and the people are going to end up saying well we don't see this as being a particularly good land for us it might be good for you but it's not a land that we can fight for so maybe again that goes to my point which is that Moses has a job here, which is Moses is there. Moses understands that this is a good land. Uh, and he's got to engage in public opinion, generate public opinion and support. Right, but it's it could be an impossible task that he it has. It could be. That's that's the point. I mean, they're they're still very much uh slaves and and you know they 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 see themselves as small. Um that's the key thing. That's the key thing there because you know, is the land good? Well, the spies come back and say, um, you know, specifically, you know, as promised, it is a land of milk and honey. Um, and this massive amount, this massive size grape, which is so big, we took, we cut one cluster of grape and it takes two people to hold it. Um, there's no, there's no disputing that the land is absolutely fertile and, and has all kinds of you know, just land-based benefits, however, and then they get to the howevers, and they and they say, but we are, it is so good that we are simply, un, you know, not up to the task of uh, of attaining it and conquering these people, because they are not giving up. Well, let's yeah. go, let, let me go into the verse there. It's verse 28, 13, 28, Ephes Kiaz, however, the people who inhabit the country are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the Anakites there. Amalekites dwell in the Negev region. Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites inhabit the hill country, and Canaanites dwell by the sea along the Jordan. Wow. So, well, so this is supposed to be set aside the classical Zionist myth of the land and the people, right? It's the people without a land Give them land without a people for people without a land. Yeah. Right. And here it's clear that the land, the promised land, is a land that you have to fight for. It. It's right. not going to be given to you. You said, Barry, before the before we started recording, you said that you had an intuition that the that the uh, conflict with Amalek, the source of the idea that the Bible has of the, of this perennial conflict with Amalek. Uh, might have actually orient, uh, originated here, and then when it appears in Exodus and Deuteronomy, uh, you know, may sort of be derivative, because otherwise, you know, what's the story of Amalek? I would say, and that may totally be correct, as a, as a, you know, a view of how the biblical text grew, but I would say that from just the perspective of somebody who's inherited the Torah as it is, you know, with, this, with its, the addition that we have, uh, the the mention of Amalek at this point is designed to just drive a stake in the hopefulness of the Israelites because you remember that worst enemy you ever had. By the way, that's they're here. We're, we're gonna go. We're gonna go knocking on their door now. No, please, no. Yeah, they're Nazis here. They're yeah, they're, right. Like, you know, and 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 there is a, a kind of mythologizing of of the land. Saying all of your all of your worst nightmares are there. Look, you know, but <laughs> but it's a good land. It's a good land. There's just giants there and Amalekites there. And you know, here is the moment of of failure. Verse thirty. Caleb hushed the people before Moses and said, "Let us alone, um, uh, Let us gain possession of it. We we can gain. We can do it. Right. Right. Like, but you know, you know, the curious thing here is that. We're obviously on the side of Kalev, right? He's from the tribe of Yehuda, the great tribe, the tribe of Melch David and his descendants. But what is he thinking here, right? I mean, the, the thing that we never consider is that he went off with 12 people, 11 others. He has one person in his camp, Yehoshua. And they all say, we can't do this. And he says, oh yeah, we're going to do this. So I, I'm critical of Kalev here. You know, I, 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 I earlier this week I was teaching a, the passage where, 
you know, there's a beautiful midrash where Kalev separates from the group and goes and lies down on the graves of his ancestors, right? Everybody goes one way, but Kalev goes to Cheb Kemarat to pray on behalf of them. And, and I, I was critical of saying, you know, that's an extravagant religious gesture. There's, he's got a lot of charisma. He's relying on his charisma, his personal charm and charisma to, to win the day. And of course, it fails. You know, oh, shh. We can do it. We can do it. Of course, you know, no, you can't do it. You can't just do it by by saying we can do it. The the negative opinion, the 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 self-perception that we're we're weak, the the experience that Israel has had under the 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 fist of Egypt, the the power of Egypt, that that's what's resonating with them. We you know, when when the, the, the spies say it's a powerful place, the place is built up. This triggers in their mind, you know, Egypt. We're back in Egypt. So, but isn't that why? Isn't that why Caleb, as a character in the in the story, like you know, whatever, we can be critical of his attempt to just sort of, you know, pep talk them into a different orientation. But isn't that the point that the that the that the story tells is that Israelites, you guys have got to leave Egypt behind. You have to be willing to, you know, undertake. You have to be willing to fight for it, as somebody said. You know, you're going to lose your country if you don't fight like hell. You're not going to have a country. Um, and and he's trying to pep talk them into what they're not capable of. But that's the point of the story: is that they need, and God discovers it, or perhaps as Ram Maimonides Ram Bam says, all God planned it all along because God knew. That all those years of slavery had bled out their their gumption. Um, they're going to need to build back the gumption, and Caleb has it, and Joshua has it, and they're going to hang on, and they're going to still have it when it's time to actually conquer the land. But this is an object lesson that that when people say no, we can't, you you do need people to say yes, we can, and even if the, even if they don't succeed in 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 persuading them uh, of that yes, we can attitude. It, it is still true that the acquisition of the yes we can attitude is going to be necessary if this is going to succeed at all. Okay, so you'll forgive me if I agree with Elliot here. Um, <laughs> as you know, I don't like to do that too much. Not but unless you absolutely have to. I, I, I think Sorry. that what we have with Kalev and Yehoshua is a failure of leadership. So they know what their path is. We're going to take the land. And the people have declared what their path is. We can't do it. And what do what is the great plan of Kalev and Yehoshua? Oh, we can succeed. But it doesn't show them. It doesn't instruct them. It doesn't bring them to a position where they can actually feel about themselves somehow different than they were feeling before. And I think it, it's a real failure of leadership. So what what would have been the success? How would like if you were in the locker room there, you know, what do you tell your team? Well, who do we play next week? <laughs> exactly. You know, it, it's I, I I think that I'm not sure, and it's a great point that you make, but I think that the, there has to be some reckoning with the legitimate fear of the people that they don't know who they are, and I think the bottom line is that a leader has to explain to them who they are. It has to give them a sense of identity. Yeah. But why doesn't that why doesn't that describe the pep talk? Because you know, you say, okay, come and Yoshua, they just, you know, whatever, they're talking a good game, but they're not they're not giving the people what they need. Like what what is the alternative in that spot, in that moment? Do they want well, to I would offer different words. It's not that we can do this. Right. In other words, I tell you this is impossible. If you come back with this is possible, that doesn't really talk to me. No, okay. So, so you need I, to show me that what am I missing? Yeah. I'm missing something that God is on our side. I was the listening. God who has led us from Egypt, who has led us in the wilderness, who is someone that we can trust and rely upon. This God has told us we can do this. So I understand that you're afraid. We're all afraid because we don't know what's going to happen. But that's the meaning of trust, that we have to trust God in order to 
be successful. So, so I was going to say that that this this kind of resonates with something I, I heard earlier this week. This the Daniel Gordis uh, podcast. He had uh, a guest on uh, talking about it's called the fourth quarter. The, you know, the, the, describing the current crisis in Israel, how inevitable it was because all countries and all civilizations, all businesses and corporate, they they go through these different cycles, and and they lose sight of their story, right? And so so. You know, it. You're right in saying it's not sufficient to say yes, we can, without grounding it in the story, and and that's precisely what Yoshua and Kalev and Moses all they do not do. They don't ground the present mission in light of the larger story. Moses certainly knows this. Moses, you know, understands the covenant. Moses understands the 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 ancestry, and Moses understands that there's a larger arc to to the 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 um the journey here but the people don't and and they have not uh they've lost sight of the larger story they got out of egypt good enough okay um but um do they know that they're changing history do they know that well, <laughs> so this is the curiosity yeah of the story is that we don't really hear of Kalev and Yehoshua as being in egypt yeah, they seem to be in a, my reading, which may be a misreading, completely out of touch with the people. Like they had a different experience. Well, and, not, not at the at you know the in the I mean I'm placed you know the Torah places the war of uh, Amalek. Yoshua is there, and Yoshua is at right, Sina but that's <laughs> afterwards. In other words, we don't hear how they were in Egypt. Why yeah. are they the two that have such a great view of how things can be? Well, Yoshua, because he's he's Moses' little water. Moshe, he's, he's Moses' Moses is right hand, right so hand. It's interesting that in our Parsha, Yoshua is given the additional name of Hoshea. Yeah. No, Hoshea is given the name of Yoshua. Right. By which points to something that's going to happen in the future, perhaps. You know, and, yeah. I was going to say that you know the the names of the 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 of these scouts, they're very interesting. They all sound like kind of nicknames, you know, Shuki, Muki, Buki, Bilti, you know. Well, they were the Jets and the Sharks. Exactly, and and so Yoshua gets that that theophoric component to it, the the God's name in it. Okay. Well, the curiosity is the commentators take pains to mention that he didn't get his name here; he was actually renamed earlier. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. All right. So so now the breakdown. It's it's the breakdown. The cry, The community broke into loud cries. The people wept that night. All the Israelites railed against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in the land of Egypt. The whole community shouted at them. If only we might die in this wilderness. Why is the Lord taking us to the land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be carried off. It would be better for us to go back to Egypt, right? Tov lanu lashuv mitraima. I heard a beautiful, you know, little word on this, which is that you know the land is their birthplace, and Egypt is the place of death, and yet they now see the the birthplace of their people as the place of death, and Egypt right. is the place so of life. What they're saying, in effect, is that it would be better for someone to kill me. Yeah. For no reason than for me to die fighting for something I believe in. What could be more abject than that? Yeah. Okay, so 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 now take us through to the to the next part, which is um Moses falls on and Aaron, they fall on their faces. They um you know, Tovar, it's a mod mod, it's too late. The land that we have traversed is exceedingly good. Um, and then um God says to Moses, How long will this people spurn me? So I mean it seems I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I'm not sure why, but the the piece about children is that children can break your heart. Yeah. But the end of the day, and at the beginning of the day, they're still your children. And God seems to forget that. 
you know, God doesn't necessarily seem, he might be a good God, but he's not a good parent. Interesting. And Moses well, different things. has to be the parent for this generation. And he pays a tremendous price. You know, last week, in last week's part, he says, am I the one who nurtured? Am I the one who gave birth to the, you know, who, who gestated this people? You know, it's it's irony because you're right. He is the parent. He is the parental. He's the mother and the father of the people in some ways. You know, and God, God, God doesn't know what to do with him. And you see the frustration of God here. But yet, God forgives in the end. Right. right. God forgives, but he also punishes. Yes. Yeah, but I, I we talked about that before. I, I don't that doesn't strike me as strange. It's it's the people what uh, Jeremy, did, let me reframe the question for a moment and then respond. Yeah. So you think that what God does is appropriate? Appropriate it, the, meaning the, so he says I forgive you and now I'm going to punish you, and that makes sense. Yes, it does. That's I, I'll say why. So explain. Okay, so the the religious import of this story is that it takes a, a whole mess of courage to fulfill the destiny. The people's immediate reaction to uh, the challenges is, oh, I can't do it. Can't do it. Too small. And and I will just revert to what I said before. You know, you guys were were negative about the big old pep Kale, Kalevian pep talk. What do the people exactly respond with? We feel like grasshoppers. We feel so small. We feel so powerless that we're just going to knuckle under before any big challenge, before the, before maybe not any challenge, but this big challenge. And and the capstone of chapter 13 is, you know, we felt ourselves to be grasshoppers, and that's how we must have looked to them. And Kalev says, we, actually, we really can't. So... So the people say, um, you know, God says to Moshe, that said, I'm killing these people. I'm wiping them out. I'm going to start all over again with you, which is not the first time we've heard this. Moshe says, please don't do that. And and God says, okay, well, tell you what, I forgive. It's, uh, it's Yom Kippur in the, in the Moshe household. Uh, uh, as we say in Kol Nidre, I forgive you as I forgive as you have said. But I have to tell you something. There's been a consequence to their cowardliness, and that that is that you don't right now get to go into the land. And I have learned something about you, uh, or, or uh, the way I would say it is, I have learned something about you and your spiritual status and what you need. Uh, Maimonides takes up this very thing and says, "This is the plan all along. This the story is kind of a ruse to get what needs to have happen, which is that they need to wander in the desert forty years to." to to build up that, that audacious self-confidence. And so even though God forgives, it still makes sense to say that there is a consequence to being that cowardly nation. Okay, so I think what you're suggesting is that when God says, I forgive, it means I'm not going to punish you now, but the punishment is going to come eventually. The punishment is the 40 years in the in the desert. Right. So in other words, you're gonna, I'm not going to kill you now, but you're going to live. Up to forty years, and then you're going to be you're going to die. By the way, like do do you do you feel like mortality is a punishment? Do you feel like the fact that another generation will come along and you know lead lead the, your people into into its future, which is an, a fact of every moment in history? Uh, I, I don't think it's a punishment exactly. I mean, in this case, obviously, it well, is a consequence it's of their negative If you get to play in the championship game and you lose. That's the kind of punishment, I would think. But we just witnessed um, in the past week the two Florida teams losing in the hockey and the basketball. <laughs> and there's, and, a, there's and, a sense that that's a punishment. And there's also a Florida man who got indicted recently. Indeed. Well, I think that's a blessing, but we'll hold that for another time. But I want to come back to something you said. So I was struck by the phrase that we were like grasshoppers in the rise. And it struck me when you were talking about it that a grasshopper is on the lowest rung of a kosher animal. So even though they see themselves quite negatively, they still see themselves within the rubric 
of purity law, Interesting. of kashrut. So all is not lost for them. Do you think that when the sentence is issued, right, when 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 they're being told you're going, bar hazeh yiplu pigrechem, you know, in this wilderness your carcasses shall drop. Of all of you who record in your various lists from the age of twenty years, muttering against me, not one shall enter the land. Da 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 da. da. You you're going to die. Okay. Um, your children will roam the wilderness for 40 years, suffering your faithfulness until the last of your carcasses is down in the wilderness. Okay, so that's pretty harsh language. But do you think it occurs to them that we're getting we're getting this generation, you know, we're making way for a new generation, that we're the transitional generation? Do, do, is there anything positive to say about this? Is there anything? Well, there is nothing positive to say about the decree. What might be positive is what they make of it. Okay. In other words, they're given the terrible sentence, right? You're told that you're not going to get to where you wanted to go. But they still have the rest of their lives to live, and they have to figure out what to do with it. So let me ask you the, the larger question from, from 20,000 feet, which is, you know, um, later prophets and, and, of course, Jewish liturgy will see the desert period, not as a punishment, but as the kind of, you know, courtship period. And, and exactly. can you go into that for a second? Because here it's a disaster, and yet the tradition kind of flips it on its head. Not the tradition, the prophets themselves. I, I remember your, the kindness of your youth, right? That's Jeremiah. Yep. Yeah, and, and the... Um... And it said, you know, that they that the generation of the Midbar was Dordea. They were the generation of consciousness. They were wrapped, you know, in in Sukkot Hoshati I I I made them dwell in Sukkot. And the the Gmaraz, you guys remember, Sukkot Mamash says Rabbi uh, Eliezer, I think, and Rabbi Akiva says uh, Anane Kavod. Kavod. So there is a way of looking at the desert period. As um, they're they're eating manna, they're wrapped in clouds of glory. They are Dordea, the generation of of consciousness and and enlightenment. And yeah, so I think that uh, I think that if you take that sort of what what I cited before as as the Rambam's reading, that God planned all along that um, that a generation that came out of Egypt was incapable of this you know huge huge task, and so. God planned all along to raise them up, to educate them, to empower them, to help them develop the capacity through 40 years in the desert. And then this story, then, then by the way, the, the series of questions that Moses gives them, gives the the 12, uh, 12 spies, could be like the smartest, you know, sneakiest maneuver of them all. Why don't you go and see how this looks, knowing full well that their reaction was going to be, you know, oh my goodness, that's this is beyond us. Does every does every people or person need a period of wandering? Um, uh, you know, well, I would put it a little bit differently. That what I would say is that as long as we are alive, our perspective can change. Yeah. And what happens is when our perspective is locked in a certain way, that's death. Whether it's a physical death or a spiritual death, what have you, doesn't matter. But. You know, I'm reminded by what you were saying, like we're familiar with the the situation where a spouse dies and the surviving spouse learns and develops skills that they never knew that they had. Yeah. But they don't go back and say, oh, what a blessing it was that my spouse died. They say that I was able to learn and to grow. And even though this was a great tragedy, I'm in a different place now. And what happens sometimes is that we can't make that leap. We can't say that we have changed. We have developed new skills. And going back to your original question, I think what happens is the wilderness, that image changes as B'nai Israel goes on because they do get to the land and they do live under a monarchy. We do lose the land not once but twice. And it allows the perspective to percolate and to change. So, so the the people kind of fold the experience of catastrophe into into their into their self understanding, 
Uh, one hopes. Yeah, one hopes. And that, uh, I, I look, that that's a good place to to kind of leave it right now, you know, because, you know, we're, we're stuck with, you know, it, it's, it, you want to kind of tear your clothes at this. This is, the, the, the dream has collapsed here. And yet, and yet out of the collapse of the dream and out of the, the fragments, something, the possibility of something new, although, of course, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, wait till next week. <laughs> well, we like we'd love you to wait to next week with us. And we want we'll to be thank back. Everybody for watching and viewing. It won't take forty years for us to finish this, but uh, <laughs> we certainly are happy. We'll Big come back with to everybody and Mazel Tov again, and we will see you again next week on the next edition of Parsha Talk. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.